Good afternoon. Hi, Monica Hendrickson, Public Health Administrator for Peoria City County Health Department. And welcome to our Tri-County Update for Thursday, January 6th. For the region of Peoria, Tazewell, and Woodford, we currently sit at 73,396 cases. That is an increase of 4,777 over the past week alone. That includes an additional 2,532 cases in Peoria County, bringing us to 36,995. An additional 1,764 cases to bring Tazewell County to 28,402, an additional 481 cases to bring Woodford County to 7,999. We are also saddened to report 32 additional deaths in the past week, bringing our to date total to 959. That includes a weekly increase of 22 deaths in Peoria County for 469, seven in Tazewell County to 376, and three in Woodford County to 114. Currently in the Tri-County, there are 5,130 individuals at home isolating with COVID-19, and there are 86 Woodford County and Peoria County residents that are currently hospitalized. Again, this does not include Tazewell County. I would like to share that um, on a, in the Tri-County, this number is became, becoming much harder for us to get a hold of, and that is because of the tsunami number of cases that are coming in daily. Um, our teams are working on it. We have to, on average, the 350 to 400 cases we get we go in and we try to determine which ones are currently still hospitalized or have become hospitalized. It is a more than a full-time job now for our team. And so this number will become more difficult and difficult to track as the numbers continue to grow. The seven day average for the Tri-County is now at 682 new cases each day. That is an increase from the 575 the last week and for Peoria County specifically, we now average 362 new cases a day, increase from 313 the past week. We have been reporting our numbers as a tri-county since March 16th of 2020. Again, that is from March 16th of 2020. And we have never, ever been at this high of a value of cases each day. Our hospitals are also seeing some of the highest numbers. Currently with OSF St. Francis Medical Center and Muni Point Health Central Illinois, the four hospitals are reporting 48 ICU beds in use and 198 non-ICU beds in use. They are also reporting in the past 24 hours, six deaths. We're now averaging 45 ICU beds in use each day and roughly 190 non-ICU beds in use. Our, in the Peoria region, which is region two of the state, we are below the 20% threshold for ICU capacity, now sitting at just under 11% availability. To speak more about how our hospitals are dealing with this, as well as what this means in terms of our systems as a whole, um, we have today with us Bob Anderson, President of OSF Healthcare St. Francis Medical Center, as well as Dr. Knapp, Regional President and CEO of UniPoint Health Central Illinois. Um, both of them will be speaking today, and we'll start with Bob Anderson. Thank you, Monica. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I thought I would just take a few moments to share um, what this impact of these much larger numbers that Monica just shared are on OSF St. Francis Medical Center. It is true we have more positive COVID patients than we've had at any given point in the pandemic. Uh, this puts a significant stress 
on our mission partners who care for these patients, uh, but it also puts a stress on the entire healthcare system. This month, and as we're taking care of these patients, we have fewer staff than we had a year ago. Um, we're like everyone else, we're, we're tired, but every day we're getting up and we're taking care of these patients. And um, you know, doing it with fewer staff than we've had in the past is definitely a challenge. Our EDs are seeing at St. Francis between 200 and 250 patients a day, and a third to 50% of those are COVID-like symptoms or are COVID-positive patients who are coming in because their uh, symptoms are getting worse. So that's, that's a real challenge for us. Uh, the result of this increase in numbers means that patients are waiting longer to get into uh, an inpatient bed, whether that's uh, waiting in the ED longer or whether that's holding in the region because we get patient uh, transfer requests from around Illinois. Uh, to come to St. Francis and they have to hold if we don't have staff or beds uh, to receive them to take care of them. And so that's a problem for patient care um, and it's something that we you know, are keeping a very close eye on. At the end of December, we started uh, restricting elective surgeries um, and I wanna be very uh, clear about that. Elective surgeries are surgeries that um, require a bed after the procedure and have the ability to be put off if they're not um, you know, a, a negative impact um, on the patient. Um, as a result, we have been pushing those uh, back. Uh, we still see anywhere from uh, 10 to 12 uh, post-op admissions every day from urgent and emergent surgeries. So we're trying to accommodate patients coming from the region, patients coming from our own emergency department, and patients who have had emergent or urgent surgeries every day um, in our ICUs and in our inpatient uh, units. And we're doing this while we're taking care of uh, the largest number of COVID patients that we've ever seen. So if I had one message that I'd like to share, it's please get vaccinated if you're not, please get boosted if you're eligible, please continue to follow the basics of masking, hand hygiene, and social distancing, because that's truly the best way that you can help our healthcare professionals. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions before I turn it over to Dr. Knapp uh, for his comments. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is there any way to know uh, of these patients that are coming in what strain, whether they have a Delta or they have Omicron, and is it mostly unvaccinated people we're seeing in the ICU beds and in the hospital? Um, the uh, question was, um, do we know what the variant is and how many of those are um, taking up our ICU beds. Um, we don't do a, the kind of analysis to determine the variant on every, of every patient, but what I'm being told it is the majority Omicron variant, um, and we are seeing those patients that are in our ICU are a majority unvaccinated patients. How would you rate This is the worst that I've ever seen it since the March of 2020 um, when we started all of this. Since March of 2020, or the, I mean, yeah, since the very beginning. Since the very beginning, yes. We've traded problems. In the beginning, there was a lot of concern about having enough PPE and enough ventilators. Uh, we have the supplies. Um, now I'm missing the, the, the nursing personnel, the techs, even, even the EVS, the housekeeping personnel that we need in order to clean the rooms, in order to bring people up from the emergency department. When I don't have those, things slow down and it makes it very hard. Are you seeing any uh, increase in patients who are fully vaccinated but still get COVID and still end up in the ICU? There are patients who have um, been vaccinated. I can't speak to whether they've received the booster shot or not because that's not something uh, that we track. Um, but we have seen patients that are vaccinated that um, do end up in the ICU. Those are a small percentage of our ICU and a smaller percentage of our total hospitalized COVID positive patients. Um, some of them may have comorbidities that put them at higher risk. Um, but um, in general, um, it's much more of a, a tsunami of the unvaccinated at this point. You mentioned um, uh, challenges with staffing. Can you speak a bit to the morale of your employees at OSF, uh, the folks who are looking at policing 
they're starting the third year of treating COVID patients? Yeah, when, when you look um, at the morale of our hospital employees, I think it's very similar to the morale of any healthcare worker. You know, we, we are tired. We have seen a solution uh, come in the form of the vaccine, only to find that, you know, it's not being um, fully accepted, which has continued uh, to create these uh, challenges for us. Uh, they're tired. Uh, we have had um, healthcare professionals decide that they're going to travel. Um, it's a type of, you know, employment where they move from hospital to hospital and they get a higher rate of pay for being willing to travel. Uh, we've had um, individuals who've decided to retire early or leave the healthcare profession altogether. You know, we've all heard about, you know, the great resignation and how many people have left the workforce in the past few months. Healthcare is not immune to that. So that really is, um, you know, our big challenge is trying to take care of uh, all these people more than ever before with fewer staff than we have. Uh, as the year ended, it seemed like there were a lot of either TV shows or kind of mockumentaries that used COVID as the butt of a joke. It, it seems like a lot of people's reaction to the disease now is that it, it's not as serious. How, how are you guys in the healthcare kind of receiving, hearing those jokes and TV shows and, and it's it maybe not It's, it's very easy to say the majority of people who get the Omicron variant don't get as sick. And scientifically, that's true. But when you're facing a family in the ICU who have a loved one who's in the process of passing away, it doesn't matter that most people don't get, you know, heavy symptoms with it. And I would say to people that maybe... Um, don't think it's serious or young healthy people that figure even if I get it it won't be bad you can't count on that you could have something else happen to you, you might you know have a an accident and, and need emergent health care you're gonna wait longer now than you would have previously so even if you're not a COVID patient this pandemic will impact you and your ability to get health care thank you I'll turn things over to Dr. Neff Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Monica and Bob. My comments will uh, be a little more brief just because I will echo everything that you've already heard. This is the worst that we've seen this pandemic. We have the highest number of patients in our three Unity Point Health Central Illinois hospitals. We have broke triple digits for the first time uh, in the last week. Uh, for the first time since the pandemic started, we've had over 100 patients hospitalized between our three hospitals. Uh, in prior waves, we largely were able to keep the ICU patients uh, that uh, needed COVID patients who needed to be in the ICU at Methodist. And uh, today we have hospitalized ICU patients at Methodist, Proctor, and Pekin, Pekin hospitals. We have record numbers of employees out with illness many, most of which uh, are COVID, uh, just like the rest of the community. So just as you heard from Bob, uh, our ability to care for patients is, is impacted not only by the record number of COVID patients, but by the staffing challenges. And we face the same issues of having fewer staff and now having staff who are ill and team members who are out with COVID. The capacity issues are real. So you heard Monica say uh, there's 11% um, ICU capacity available. Um, I, that's just not true. Uh, that may be the number of beds that are available, but we don't have that, those beds staffed. So our ICUs are full today, and in order for us to accept more patients, uh, we'll have to find staff that can uh, take care of those patients and since there aren't any more staff and there aren't more travelers available we will ask the existing staff to do more uh, and uh, as you've heard uh, everybody's tired uh, everybody's already working hard so uh, uh, there's really an intense amount of stress on the teams that are caring for these patients uh, we have similarly put uh, uh, policies in effect to limit the number of elective surgeries 
Another way to describe those would be to say non-essential surgeries. So for those people who have uh, a life-threatening illness, uh, cancer, uh, life-threatening immediate heart issue, um, we'll still perform that surgery. But if it's something that can wait, we're going to ask you to wait. Um, and as Bob already mentioned, that is going to impact uh, people. And unfortunately, that also has health consequences because even though those things aren't immediately life-threatening, they still need to be performed. And then I would just uh, conclude before answering questions. Um, we're not here to spread fear. We're not here to cause anger. We're not here to point fingers. We absolutely don't want to cause shame. But we do want to ask for action. And as you've heard already, the best thing we can do as a community, for our own sakes, for the sake of our healthcare workers, is to get vaccinated, and if we're vaccinated, to get boosted. The second most important thing is to wear masks, especially when we're inside and in any area where we're close to people. So we just plead with, with everyone to do both of those two things. It will make a difference. We have the same statistics uh, across the country at Unity Point and at St. Francis, which says the best way you can lower your risk is to get vaccinated. And the people who are most likely to be in an ICU are those that aren't. Nothing's 100%. And if you're immunocompromised, you have other comorbidities, or you're just a person who happened to be more susceptible, you could still have a really serious outcome and even death um, despite having had the vaccine. But it still lowers your risk dramatically and can make a huge difference. So with that, I'm also happy to take any questions. Uh, the question was, you know, what, what will happen if this continues to get worse or if it, if it continues? Um, we're going to continue to show up for work every day, and we're going to deploy every resource we have to take care of people. Um, what will happen is, is uh, people will wait longer for care, and they'll be cared for by staff, doctors, techs, nurses, uh, team members who are doing more um, for more people with less time and are more tired and um, have more responsibilities and perhaps um, don't have the same level of training to do the jobs that we need them to do because they've been called in from other areas. So there'll just be uh, longer waits and increased risk. And, um, you know, do we ever get to the breaking point? I sure hope not, uh, that we, you know, can't provide a needed service to somebody. But uh, there is risk for that if uh, the numbers continue to go up um, and, and don't slow down. So we will hope for the best. We'll continue to be here, um, but we really ask everybody to do their part. When you ask people to get vaccinated in the community, like, are there uh, extra steps, like maybe not going out as much, not um, spending as much time in one or two certain stores, things like that? And that was asked at the beginning of the pandemic, and to be honest, after the pandemic, I'm a hospital, but yeah, I've been to that event. I'd love to get people to doing that again. Yeah, we would appreciate that everybody consider uh, the choices you make around um, um, activities that bring increased risk. And uh, I think we've also all, you know, things have evolved in the pandemic. And Bob already mentioned we have PPE and supplies, and that was an issue before. We've tried having kids stay home from school, and we've seen the detrimental effects, you know, of not being able to socialize and not get education. So. Uh, I, d I don't think we're here today saying everything should shut down, we should all stay at home, uh, because we know there's pros and cons of all of those things. But at the same time, uh, there's a difference between you know going to school, wearing a mask, going to work, wearing a mask, uh, going out to a restaurant and wearing a mask in and out and, and sit sitting uh, carefully versus going to a crowded bar or an event and being around 50 people with masks off. So we absolutely would ask everybody to take uh, special care until we can see that we're uh, turning the corner here. Is there an option to ask for federal assistance? So the question, is there an option to ask for federal assistance? There is. Uh, we have already asked for state assistance, and uh, the state has had a uh, mechanism in place where we can ask for staff members, and we have uh, called upon that and received some help. We've uh, not received everything we've asked for because the state hasn't had the resources to provide that. 
but they did just recently now give us an avenue to apply for federal uh, resources for staff, and so we are making that ask as well, and uh, we'll see if uh, anything's able to come from that. Uh, we don't know for sure where those res resources would come from, uh, you know, just knowing what federal resources would be available. Perhaps it's from the, the Armed Services, National Guard, perhaps it's from other federal resources, um, perhaps it's looking at areas that are less impacted and uh, being able to pull from those areas. I, I don't know, I'm speculating here. Um, so um, uh, we'll see what can come forward. Okay. And it's unprecedented, you've never said that it would ask for those kinds of resources before? No, we've not. So the question was, are we needing to pull staff from clinic areas, urgent cares, uh, to come into the hospital? Uh, we are doing that, but we've not yet done so from our clinic settings or our urgent cares. Um, we've redeployed from other areas. Uh, that will still be an option that we can exercise if we have to. Um, but um, our clinics are experiencing the same challenges, of course, for staffing issues and people out sick as well. And so we're trying to keep the doors open there too. So the question was about new antiviral therapies that have come available, and does that provide us any hope? Um, with your permission, I think that's a great segue for me to ask Dr. Sater to come up. Oh, Dr. Sure. Samer Sater is our chief medical officer, and um, I asked him to attend today to help with uh, medical questions. I think he might have a couple comments to make too. So, Dr. Sater. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Keith. So I'll start by a small comment and then I'll address the antivirals. One of the main things that people ask me is, are people in the hospital testing positive who are there for other problems or are they there because of COVID? I can tell you 90% plus are in the hospital because of COVID illness. Over half of our intensive care unit is COVID related complications. So for whatever you're hearing out there, the people in the hospital, there is the rare person who tests positive who's there for something else, but that is not what's straining our resources. When you look at a COVID patient in the intensive care unit, they're staying there about eight to 12 days. That's the average. The average length of stay before COVID, without COVID, is in the three to four day range. So that is the level of nursing techs that they're talking about that were short that are having to take care of patients who are staying there longer. So the perception that people are just testing positive in the hospital, that is not what we have here. Maybe it's true in other parts of the country. I really doubt it. We're not that special. Uh, so we're all doing the same things. So that for sure is, is who we are taking care of today. Uh, regarding the antivirals. It, they will be helpful based on the studies. They do tend to reduce uh, the need for hospitalization and the potential need for critical care. So they reduce what we call morbidity, which is side effects and disadvantages of being ill, and mortality, which is the chances of dying. Unfortunately, the availability of these medications is not going to be wide and it's not going to be overnight. So we're looking at very small number of treatments targeted at patients who are at the highest risk. Who are these people? If I say it again, I think my wife is going to get mad at me. But it's the vulnerable patients. Those are the immunosuppressed, cancer patients, transplant patients, rheumatological patients, patients with any sort of autoimmune disease, 
HIV patients. To be clear, those patients may not respond to the vaccine because of their illnesses or the medications that they take. So those patients get a priority for some of these treatments as they become available and they're in short supply. The other thing that I've, I've thought about was if in March of, la of 2020 or at the beginning of this pandemic, if somebody told me you're gonna get a vaccine that it's not perfect, it doesn't prevent everything, but that vaccine lowers your chances of landing in the hospital and lowers your chances of needing an ICU bed and dying, would I have taken that bargain? The answer is yes. I would have taken that bargain back when this started at a first, first option, but I'll buy it. So I ask people, take that into consideration. Is it as good as we want it? Is it perfect? No, we're not saying that. We are asking you is, if you're at risk, if you live with somebody at risk, if you hang out with somebody at risk, do yourself and do your family members, friends and loved ones a favor, get vaccinated. I'll take questions. Um, can I ask you about masking? We've seen um, some reports now that uh, they say that the N95 mask may work more against almost the Omicron variant. Um, are, you, uh, is, are we suggesting locally that people go out and try to find those masks versus uh, maybe some of the other ones that they're using now? The question is regarding the type of mask and Omicron, N95 versus a regular mask. A, a regular mask is probably good enough as long as you keep a distance, so we're a little far away here, so whatever I'm doing is not affecting her. So if I happen to have the virus right now and I haven't quite fallen ill, it, I don't wanna give it to anybody else. So keeping a little distance and masking helps, and N95, protects you against, against a specific type of aerosol products that are not the main way that the virus is transmitted necessarily. But if you're on a specific treatment, if you're receiving a, an intubation, which is when we put the tube down somebody's throat to breathe for them, certain things make a lot of aerosols. And that's when N95 really works the best. If you've ever worn an N95, it's hard to wear one all day long. Uh, they're not very comfortable. So the, the benefit between the comfort and wearing something all the time versus trying to take it off all the time, it, it starts to play into it. So I, don't, I wouldn't tell people go get an N95. The Omicron is more infectious because probably it takes less amount of virus to get you infected. So the exposure total amount may be less. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other way is that if the vaccines are not quite perfect and you spread it, then you hit somebody who's vulnerable, then that person gets ill. So even if Omicron is mild, if it infects a ton of people at once, you still crash the hospital like we're kind of crashing right now. The question is regarding uh, patients who are five years or younger and have we seen them in the hospital. We don't have a pediatric, large pediatric population at Unity Point Health, so I am not the best person to answer that. Uh, anecdotally, uh, those have not been the bulk of the patients that we're seeing. Uh, it's really still the diabetic, overweight, immunocompromised, unvaccinated, that's the population. I don't know why we're not seeing a lot of cases of young people, that was the question, uh, a lot of cases. But like I said, we don't have a large pediatric ICU unit, so uh, Bob Anderson may be better equipped to answer that one. For the parents, the best way to protect them is if you are unable to get ill or as ill because you're vaccinated and you have a reduced chance of getting the virus by being vaccinated, you're protecting your loved one. 
So when I say protect your friends, your loved one, your family, uh, you know, if I'm young, if I'm 20 and super healthy and my odds are really low of getting super sick, but I get my dad sick or I get my grandfather ill, my grandmother ill, that has consequences. And that's why I always say protect your fat loved ones and family. The question is, how do we feel about coming to the hospital and the emergency room is full and, and the effects of people dying or, or having to care for this number of people? Uh, I tend to be fairly resilient, so at a personal level, uh, it's, I've told other people it's part of our DNA is to care for patients. When I want to care for patients, I don't really want to worry about whether or not the patient is in the right place to receive the care or has the right staff to receive the care. So that part is frustrating because I know that there isn't a lot of more levers left for the administrators like myself to pull on to, to get people into the right spot. Uh, so that, it, that can be frustrating and it does get you mad and you wish that you could get you know, infinite resources, but we have to be realistic. There is a limited amount of resources, and we have to manage them. Could you uh, speak to the ongoing value and importance of the PCR test? Uh, we're hearing vaccinated people who uh, end up being PCR timely, not that they didn't back then any time, are negative on those rapid tests, even though via CVS or Walgreens. Um, and I've also heard from people taking two rapid tests, one a nose swab and one a throat swab. The question is regarding the rapid test versus the PCR and uh, how worthwhile or effective are they. The way I look at them is they have two different roles. The PCR is the gold standard. I use it in the hospital and I use it when I have a high, I have a, a need to know and the risk of not knowing whether it's real, real positive or not when somebody's symptomatic, the PCR is the gold standard. Now the rapid tests are things that you can do at home and they're not meant to have the same type of sensitivity. But they have a very good place in our tool set. So if, you, if we had a ton of rapid tests and everybody had them at home and they tested themselves when they had symptoms and isolated themselves, that would help us greatly. That would help them and it would help the community. Even if the test isn't perfect, if it catches X number of people and those people are isolated, that's less infection in the community overall. So I don't think we look at it as one is better or one is different. They're just different tools. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. I, I just have a question. Um, I have a, a question about a, a medical ethics question. You talk about limited resources, and earlier when you mentioned the antiviral drugs that are going to be rolled out, kind of weighing um, who you're going to give these limited resources to. And I know in your profession that that's a question every day of who should you, who goes into your ER, you know, with one ventilator, who should you give it to? Um, are you? The question is about the ethics and whether or not we would, we would weigh the vaccination status of a patient when we're deciding on limiting resources. And the answer is we're lucky to live in the U.S. We don't really encounter scarcity to your description of having only one vent and two patients. We're lucky that we, we don't live in that situation day in and day out. When I look at a patient and I'm just trying to decide who you know, if I have limited amount of antivirals and I have an unvaccinated at-risk person who's 65 and diabetic and I have somebody who's vaccinated, well, I know the vaccine works and lowers your risk 
of needing the hospital and a bad outcome. So that I actually would probably give it to the unvaccinated person to try to avoid that person having a bad outcome. At the end of the day, the vaccination status does not affect how I treat the patient uh, from a, a resource standpoint. I'm just looking at it as which patient is gonna get the most bang for the buck of that specific treatment and how does that affect the entire community? And at this point, we're talking about the hospital resources. So if I had an at-risk unvaccinated person, I probably give them the treatment because the community would benefit. Now, you know, I would hope that they go get vaccinated before it comes to that. <laughs> uh, but if it came to that, we, we try to do what's right for each patient. So, uh, you know, kind of to bring this uh, briefing a little bit to a close, uh, you've heard from three of our communities, and I would say uh, state and national experts on this. And again, you know, want to reiterate that message that was clearly done, which is get vaccinated and get boosted. Um, with that in mind, the health department did receive some state allocation and resources, including staffing, that we will be now offering walk-in vaccine clinics Saturday and Sunday through January and February from nine to five. Again, these are walk-in vaccine clinics, Saturday and Sunday at the health department from nine to five. We will still continue to offer vaccine clinics Monday through Friday from 8.30 to four, again, walk-in only. So seven days a week, there is a walk-in clinic that you do not need to schedule an appointment for, but you just need to show up to. Um, we have bus routes that go by the health department routinely, as well as ample parking. At these clinics, we will be offering starting tomorrow for 12 uh, boosters for individuals 12 and older, as well as for individuals 5 through 11, the additional primary dose or third, third dose for those children that are moderately or uh, severely immunocompromised. So that means starting uh, tomorrow, seven days a week, all types of vaccinations, boosters, primary dosing, um, third doses, if need be, are going to be available at the health department on a walk-in basis. So again, the threshold and the barriers, we are decreasing as much as possible. So please take advantage of it. Get vaccinated, take care of your community, and um, take care of our hospital systems. You know, they need a break after two years as well. So with that, I'll open up to questions. So um, to the large increases in deaths, there's a little bit two parts to this. One, sadly, with increased cases, there's increased mortality. Um, but also with the surge of cases and our team reviewing them consistently, um, we have to kind of go through it in batches. And so through our audit trail, we did see a few. But again, none of these were, you know, months apart. They were maybe, um, I think the oldest one we had was maybe over a week. So again, these were relatively in the past two weeks, we are seeing that those increases in deaths. So the question is, uh, of the five and under, um, why are we not seeing as um, severity of cases? Because I think that's a key delineation. We are seeing positives in that population. Kids are testing positive. They are having mild to moderate symptoms. What we haven't seen yet, and I would say knock on wood, throw salt, whatever you want to do, because um, I don't think we would ever want to see that, is we're not seeing them severely ill or critically ill yet. And so the question is, you know, what is this? Um, you know, it could be the type of variants. It could be just the anatomy of a child, the size of them, all of that. Um, and I will also say the protective factor of our school, school systems, too. All of these kind of play into a role. Um, but having said that, you know, we've been lucky thus far. And, you know, I think the best thing we can do to continue to protect that population as well as any pr uh, population is create that shield around them. Get vaccinated, wear a mask, socially distance. to get over this hump and not let it happen again if 
the population that um, will not get vaccinated, and what you guys say is what's causing it, or not what's causing it, but what's keeping it going. Um, if, if that population doesn't increase enough, or we don't continue to get boosted enough, and we keep running into that era of everyone booster, everyone needs a booster, and that's why you know it's not happening. Like, what stops that? What, how do we how do we get over this hump? How do we stop this from happening? So I'll paraphrase the question as, you know, we seem to be in kind of that hamster wheel, right? And how do we get out of this? You know, the level of immunity of our population is going to be key. And right now, you know, the best way we can reach that type of level is going to be vaccinations. And, you know, having to have a booster or having this repeated is not something new. We do it with influenza routinely as well. But sadly, you know, this might extend on for a long period of time if to the point people are not taking advantage of this and seek to get natural immunity, meaning that they seek to get sick. And so we're gonna still see the tsunami of cases, we're gonna still see the capacity issues in our healthcare system and our, um, and our, you know, even our secondary and tertiary kind of safety net systems as well. So it won't end until we can really help people understand and it be, be a variety of educational points, but have that conversation or understanding of why they need to get a vaccine. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to ask you very briefly about schools. Like, uh, for example, we know that Peoria Public Schools delayed um, their return from their winter break until next week. Um, we were wondering from the uh, health department standpoint, is the health department kind of advising schools maybe on, you know, if they need to take that break? And if so, maybe what metrics should schools be looking at um, as they make a decision like that to, uh, you know, delay school, take a break, you know, anything of that sort? So regarding the schools and kind of the guidance the health departments work through with the schools, I will just... Um, give credit to Beth Kreider, the Peoria County Superintendent. She hosts a meeting routinely with all the superintendents, both private and public for Peoria County. Um, and um, the health department sits on that meeting um, almost weekly with them. And we do answer guidance questions and walk through you know, what they're seeing. Um, as um, my peers have indicated, the schools you know, are a protective factor, you know, both from an educational standpoint, socializing, nutrition, there's a lot of reasons why you know, having kids in schools is very important. So we don't take any of the steps lightly to either go into what's known as adaptive pause or remote learning. And a lot of that has to do with what we're seeing in that individual school setting. Um, Peoria Public School District, Superintendent Karat communicated with our offices prior to get an understanding of where she was at, where her resources were at, and what was gonna be challenges for her to maybe come back online the way she wanted to. And so again, this is a lot of conversations and I will just say that no one takes this lightly. This is, um, this is an ongoing conversation that we have routinely so they understand what's going on and what's impacting it. Because again, sometimes it's not what's happening in their school, it's what's happening in the outside community that's really driving when you see a school that has maybe you know, 30 kids out, but it's not because the school did anything, it was because families were hosting ga gatherings, whether it was like a spaghetti dinner or something, for, you know, and that's where you're seeing the cases originate from. So not related directly to the schools themselves, sadly. So first and foremost, there is a lot of testing options out there. I will say when there is um, a gap in testing or limited resources, you also see, sadly, at the same time, scams start appearing as well, promising that they will come to your home, but maybe it's not a valid test, and they may not even uh, give you results from it as well. So again, first and foremost, if you are looking for testing sites, visit the Illinois Department of Public Health website and their testing page. They list a variety of testing locations, and these are um, labs that have confirmed that they're reporting back to the state that they're giving out results. So trust those first. Um, if you purchase your own at-home test, that's great. You can go that route. But I'd be very hesitant if you get a private message or see an advertisement on social media saying that I will come to your home for $10 and give you a test. Um, if you are starting to see some of this, you can actually, I think the governor even commented on it, that you can reach out to the Illinois Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division, and they are responsible for those type of entities that are um, kind of doing that type of practice. Now, if you have a question about a 
legitimate operation and maybe the practices of them, then you can talk through regulation and the IDPH hotline. But that's for, for example, you're uncertain that somebody was wearing proper masking or gloves when they took your sample at a laboratory versus these Facebook pop-ups that you want to direct to consumer protection. So some uh, federal funds and state funds are going for testing sites, but those are going to be posted. Even if they are mobile, they will still be posted. So again, I'm can, uh, even if they're offering it for free to come to your home, if it's not associated with one of those state locations or those state labs, um, or those that are identified at the state website as having mobile, again, I'd be very concerned about um, taking on the option, even if it's free. Yes, I again recommend going to the Illinois Department of Public Health website. Um, your pop ups are not, sorry, your walk in um, uh, vaccination booster site is exactly where I got my booster. Um, the you know, room full of people is, it, but it was really fast, which is great. Um, I'm curious if you, and again, this is asking you know, to speak anecdotally, but are there really people who are showing up and getting their first dose? People are not necessarily tech savvy. Uh, word of mouth is part of it. Um, but sadly, I think the largest percentage is because someone that they loved got COVID and ended up hospitalized, and now they understand the severity of it. And so um, it had to take that experience for them to get. And I would really hope that people don't continue to wait to have that experience to be the reason why they get a vaccine. I will just end with one, um, hopefully, request from the media. Um, with the surges of cases that we are having, as well as everyone being short staffed, even some of our state agencies that help us on this, um, if you are an entity that's looking for a return to work or a release letter out of isolation or quarantine, the best way to access this is going to be calling 312-777-1999. Again, that's 312 Seven 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 one nine nine nine. Please do not call the health department directly. By calling this number, it directs to your correct local health department, as well as if your case is being managed by a different entity, it will work through that one as well. But um, we just ask for patience. You know, just like the healthcare systems are, you know, being inundated, we are being inundated investigating high priority cases, outbreak cases. So if your employer is seeking a letter as this, uh, and if you are an employer that has historically been asking for letters to return from work, um, just note that it is a very difficult process that we are having as locals to get those letters out in a timely fashion. So again, that 312 number is going to be great. I understand it's a Chicago suburb number, but please do not worry. It does get routed to the correct location. Okay, thank you everyone.